Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and in this episode, because nobody has donated an electric car for me to tear down, I thought we'd start small scale and go with an electric vehicle charging point. Come on people, you know where I am. few things to start off with. Uh, there is going to be loads of terminology we're going to have to cover before this really works, but I'm going to caveat the whole thing with UK regs. I am UK based, so obviously I'm working with what I can get hold of and also with what I'm familiar with. And based on how a majority of UK premises work, most EV charging points are centered around being outside. There are two types tethered and untethered, which basically means you have a cable that is hardwired to it, being the tethered type with a socket on the end of the cable. Big distinction, it's not a plug because it's the female receptacle. And the other type is the untethered, which is where there is a socket hard mounted to the wall and you would use a cable to connect it to your car. Now that cable would normally be a male to female cable. However, there are caveats to that because not everybody has a dedicated EV charging point and certainly with some of the plug-in hybrids, you would expect people to be plugging them into either a normal, in our case, British standard 13 amp outlet, in which case the charging controller is built into a box on the cable and you do see that. If you're not using a 13 amp plug, then you might be using a 60309, an IEC 60309. 60309? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, which is the commando plugs. And that could be up to a single phase or three phase. And that goes 16 amp, 32 amp, 63 amp. Seems unlikely you're gonna have those in your home, but it's possible, but you will still need a charging controller. And we'll get into why later. For this, I have what is a type two charger. It was tethered, but for some reason, it's had its cable and plug removed. I assume we will find out some reason why, maybe when we get inside. So in a big surprise to absolutely no one, I would say the international electric vehicle charging market is a bit of a mess with different levels, different types, different connectors in different countries. It's not like you could just buy an EV or build an EV and ship it internationally you're almost certain to have the wrong voltage, the wrong current, the wrong controllers. This is the 21st century. I thought we would be better than that now. When it was like the 60s when we invented containerization and every, everybody just went, okay, that's the standard, we'll all do it. I realize I'm in a country that still drives on the left-hand side of the road. So, oh, okay, so first up, this RCD, which is accessible from the front, although I did notice there's actually a seal here that you could use. So you could put like a tamper-proof tag in there. Now I'm not sure what circumstances you would need that in because this is just an RCD, a residual current or ground fault isolator as I think they're called in other countries. And this one is required by UK regs for uh, a, an EV charging port. And I'm very, I can't, I, like I say, I can't think of a reason why you would tamper-proof that unless this was one on for public use, maybe? But as I say, this is likely to be outside, which is why you see this IP65 protection on the front. There's a nice little uh, capacitive vandal-proof, waterproof button there, which uh, will be used to sort of initiate charging once you plug it in. And that's the first sort of hint at why you don't just plug a cable straight from an outlet into the car, unless it's got one of those charging controllers on the box, on the cable. It's nice that they've used um, can, like lugs for connectors here. And I really like the construction they've gone with in here because this is all just standard DIN rail mounting equipment. I think we touched on that when we talked about circuit protection and RCD devices and protective devices. So that shouldn't come as a surprise that all of this is DIN rail mounted, but it's a good way to go because it means it's modular. If some component in here fails, you've got the option of just replacing the parts, not the entire thing. And it means that this company that make this can actually use different configurations, different modules to make the whole thing work together. 
So what have we got in here? So there is a Rolex, which is the make of the, the charging point. They've got their own controller in here and they call it the Mode 3 controller to an IEC standard. And we've got a big contactor. That is a four pole contactor. Yeah, four pole contactor. The RCD, which I believe is on the output side, or at least that's how I would wire it. I don't have the instructions, but I can look that up later. So I would imagine, well, no, just the way it's wired, actually. You know, I'd kind of assumed that this was used. And other than the fact it's had the cable nicked off of it, there's no entry gland. Like you would expect a knockout or a gland or a hole in this box somewhere for the power to come into it to power it. But there isn't one. So maybe this hasn't been used. That's very confusing. So depending on how this RCD likes to be wired, I think it will be input on the top, output on the bottom, through the contactor, and then single phase AC on the output side. And that's just to the charging pins on the plug. Now the actual rectification and voltage control to the device is built into the car, unless you're going for DC supercharging. But what EV chargers are designed to do is to stop you plugging in an energized cable into the car. So there are a couple of pins which are labeled CP and PP on the connector. And one of those is pre-connection and one of those is post-connection. And the idea being that the, that will return a signal to the controller before it will close the contactor. And this is just, I mean, a contactor is just a big relay and you can, they make a really pleasing ka-chunk noise rather than the click that a relay does. But this controller will be wired to the control solenoid on here. And when this receives the signal from the car, it will enable the button to charge, which you then press, and that will actually start or allow the current to flow through the contactor. So of the five pins that will be connected through here, two are switched here, live and neutral on the con contactor, Earth is permanent or the CPC circuit protective conductor. And then you'll have two for the controller, which is the CP and this PP. So let's pop out some of these DIN rail modules and have a little closer look. Here's your input voltage, nice stranded cables uh, with ferrule crimps on them, which is always good to see. It's a decent way of installing and these smaller connections on the bottom will be the coil control. And then we can get that contactor out. And we've got the RCD at the top. Now the insides of the RCD basically won't differ. Oh, actually, thinking about this, yeah, that will be the output side of the RCD running the controller as well. Now, if you're interested in how an RCD, or residual current device, or an RCBO works, head over to the Element 14 community. I'll post a link below. So unusually, this earth terminal, so when you're, when you're putting metallic DIN rail in an enclosure, you typically want that to be earthed. It's extraneous metal work, it's safer to be earthed. And earth DIN rail blocks tend to actually have a screw that you screw down to the DIN rail to make sure it's connected. So I'm a little bit surprised that they haven't here. You can see where that stranded connectors being cut off there. So very helpfully, sort of everything on here is labeled and even that output is labeled at five volts. So I know that nice little capacitive sensor is uh, five volts. Bit of a shame that the rest of the cables are missing to the extent that I don't really see clearly where they would have been connected to. I wonder if I can get a data sheet for this. It looks like a very, very capable controller that is woefully underutilized in here. Now at the top, we've obviously got a neutral live and earth connector, which is the power. So inside here, there's gonna be a switch mode power supply, probably switch mode power supply, could be rectified. On the bottom side, we've got RGB, which I can't hear and not think red, green, blue. EN, SDN, SDL. TX and RX, interesting. 
what kind of comms did this have on board? And then we've got ground and PX, which are looped together with this little short and CP and error. Now CP and error, I can see that the terminals are actually slightly open, like they've been unscrewed, which makes me think that they were actually connected to the signal pins on the uh, tethered lead. Get rid of this, a little jumper lead. Haha, <laughs> big relay there. So I'm feeling quite happy with that diagnosis or that guesswork of common relay one, relay two. So I think that's Good guess so far. Whoop. Awesome. We've got two hard service controller, which are sort of sat like that, giving us that those four banks of terminals. We've also got a pin out. Ah. I wonder if that's like a debugging or programming header. Should be able to slip each side apart now. Yeah. So this side I'm guessing is live, neutral, and earth with these three pins up here, which I'm guessing. I mean, that's not great separation, considering the set of terminals below is HLA, HLO, MPI, which I'm not sure what they are yet. And on the bottom half, you've got receive, transmit, and ground, and R, G, and B. We've got a couple of relays down here. Wait, 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 wait. No, that's not the relay. That's the switch mode power supply, which is providing the 5 volts and 12 volts. But how's the 230 volts getting from there to there? I really hope it's not on this ribbon. Since this ribbon says it's rated at 60 volts, am I missing something really obvious here? That was the only thing connecting the two halves, and the live, the neutral come in this side. And then they put that in the middle, which is only rated at 60 volts. That can't be right. Which it doesn't, which doesn't make a... Okay, so fuse is shorted to AC input, which makes sense. Okay, so that in the center here, that I'm just trying to scrape the conformal coating off of right now, is an Atmel microcontroller. What I'm trying to work out is what everything else does. Do you think this is a programming header? Okay, so that does look like it's a programming header. Hi, it's me from the future and I've got to interrupt myself at this point here because I made a mistake. See, what I did when I took the two PCBs out of the container is assumed that the way up I had it was up and it wasn't. I had the two sides flipped. So what I did from here on was try and understand and explain and probe everything so it made sense to me. And what I was doing was confusing the input terminals from the top and the bottom and as such the left and the right. So what looked to me at the time like the relay output terminals was actually the DC, the AC input. And when you consider that, the whole thing makes way more sense. Let me break this down for you. So looking back at this module, you've got power on one side, the RGB TX RX on the bottom. So this side is the side with the black on it, albeit I had it on the table upside down. And what this means is the white relays, which I thought ended up at the bottom down here, were actually up here next to the power. So all that LV, the, the uh, 230 volt potentially, is still at the top. And that's also why when I was disconnecting the wiring, we had this common feed. So actually the relays are volt-free contacts at the top until you put that live feed into the, uh, the common port, which incidentally is not the right way to go about it, but that's a subject for another time. So yeah, TX and RX at the bottom, all the uh, RGB for the LED, the debugging header, header um, is all on the other side. So there were no 230 volt signals going through that cable like I thought there were at the time. My mistake, you live and learn. 
So I'm going to pick up the outro back here in the edit because what I've learned since then actually changes significantly the entire content of how I closed out the outro. With the incoming feedback from the charging plug and the microcontroller actually just switching a relay, this module is a great little device which Rolex can put in a lot of their devices to make them all work in a very common way. With the RX and TX, the, the RS232 communication, they've got the flexibility to add card readers, GSM modems, even wireless, depending on the application that they need to use this module in. It's a great idea, you just have to flash your own software to it. What I will say is that with a little bit of careful thinking, there is no reason you couldn't build your own. And I'm not suggesting you do this. I've no idea what laws or warranties on your electric vehicle you would void by doing this, but it would be very simple to build your own electric vehicle charging controller. So long as you maintain the safety for separation between high voltage, low voltage and DC, so long as you have that uh, CP and PP kit pin, and so long as you have all your earthing connected up with the RCD and decent sized contactor, it is possible you could build your own EV charging point. And if you've got home hub or something like that, you could build something really nicely integrated. Just food for thought. If you have an idea of how you might like to build an EV charging point, let me know over at the Element 14 community. Thank you so much for watching this unfortunately bitty video. I'll see you next time.